laboratory directions for the digestive system. Learning objectives specifically for the oral cavity. Be able to distinguish the different subdivisions of the oral cavity and relate the morphological structure of each subdivision to its function. Two, be able to recognize the type of papillae, taste buds, minor salivary glands, and musculature associated with the tongue. Three, be able to differentiate between the three major salivary glands according to their structure and relate these structural differences to their functions. And four, be able to distinguish the subcomponents of developing teeth and their associated cell types. This field is a portion from the region of the human lip, uh, which will be studied in just a moment. When considering the tubular part of the digestive system, as well as the oral cavity, that is the surrounding walls, it's the best to consider the organization of these regions in strata or layers. Those structures observed in the lips will correspond to other regions or other strata found elsewhere, elsewhere in the limiting boundaries of the oral cavity, uh, such as the, uh, the lip and the cheek area will be very equivalent, as well as we will see layering in the hard and soft palate as well, and even to some degree in the floor of the oral cavity as well. What we're seeing using the lowest power scanning objective that's available is the outer or external surface of the lip. And one would anticipate, and indeed this is the case, it's lined by a typical thin skin. That is, the outer surface shows a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, an underlying uh, dermis structure with its two subcomponents, a very fine reticular layer, and an under, or uh, papillary layer, excuse me, an underlying reticular layer, that it's, though it's broken up by uh, other features of the integument. Uh, as one would anticipate with thin skin, there are going to be numerous sebaceous glands and sweat glands present. Here we can see the uh, hair follicle and a little bit of the hair shaft uh, as indicated by the arrow. And so as one just courses along the external surface of the lip, as one would expect, these structures repeat themselves but over and over again. So this is what we're viewing at the present in the field of view, the external surface of the lip, which is, uh, as one would anticipate and realize, uh, typical thin skin in its structure. Now as one courses uh, to the interior of the lip, the tissue begins to change, one can see skeletal muscle fibers making their way towards the uh, underlying uh, skin, or overlying skin, excuse me, and this will give some degree of mobility uh, to the uh, integument covering the uh, lip. The heart, or the center of the lip structure, as well as the cheek, is going to be skeletal muscle. So what is coursing into the field of view are large bundles or uh, regions of skeletal muscle as indicated uh, in this region by the arrow which happens to be fibers, skeletal muscle cells that is of the obicularis oris muscle. Now if this section were in the uh, cheek area this would be the buccinator muscle. One would start out there with typical uh, thin skin uh, a buccinator muscle, and then making your way uh, to the mucosa. And as we are coursing right through the lip, one can uh, chance, uh, as one be expected, because this is skeletal muscle, large nerve bundles, which are going to provide their innervation. And now finally we're getting into another connective tissue area, which in this case will happen to be the submucosa. And in the field of view, is one of the minor salivary glands. This is one of the labial glands uh, uh, that will be found in the 
uh, submucosa on the internal surface of the lip, and these can be uh, actually felt if one firmly presses their tongue along the interior surface of the lip. One will feel little mounds or bumps, slightly smaller than a match head. These are these minor labial salivary glands. Once again, these are compound tubular acinar type glands of a mixed variety. Their major component are mucus cells, but they do show the serous demolun uh, form, so they are indeed mixed glands. And as we course through uh, these glands, the connective tissue that they are lying or residing within is the submucosa. So this connective tissue surrounding and enveloping the glands is a, a layer of submucosa. And as we approach the uh, mucosal surface, we can see the duct following along uh, and will eventually empty into this region. We'll give the interior lip that slippery uh, mucous membrane uh, type of field. feel. Now this is the epithelium lining the oral cavity. It's a non-keratinized stratified squamous form. Indeed, even at this power one can see intact or nuclei and uh, squames exfoliating from the uh, surface of this particular structure. So it's a non-keratinized variety. It's extraordinarily thick. Uh, it has very elongated, as one would anticipate, papillae extending up into this type of epithelium, which in life is transparent and on the interior of the mouth usually has a pink or a slightly red hue to it. This is because of the vascular papillae that extend up into this particular uh, region. The connective tissue uh, underlying the mucosa and going to about this level is lamina propria. So this is the typical mucous membrane or mucosa of the oral cavity. It has a stratified squamous epithelium of the non-keratinized variety, so it's wet, wet and an underlying supporting felt work nature of uh, connective tissue, the lamina propria. Those two elements make up the mucous membrane or the mucosa. And the underlying more coarse type of connective tissue that contains the minor salivary glands, of course, is the uh, submucosa. And it's not surprising that there is a little bit of fat and what have you in this particular area. Here's another one of these minor salivary glands. Uh, and I'm looking for an area that we get sort of a break right at the edge of the slide where it separates a little bit. So this is definitely lamina propria. You can see it at this scanning magnification. And then a coarser, more looser type of connective tissue, uh, uh, the submucosa, that's actually going to contain uh, the glands. Now the structure of the cheek will be exactly the same uh, from a morphological basis if one had a section through it. Uh, the main difference being that it won't show continuity at the top with the overlying or uh, the exterior lying uh, skin. And here once again we're perhaps getting just a little bit more a better demarcation uh, for visualization, the lamina propria extending about uh, at this level, these coarser fibers with fat, nerves, and the minor salivary glands indicating the uh, submucosa. And here, once again, we can <coughs> excuse me see that demarcation quite uh, a little, uh, quite well, right about where the tip of the arrow uh, is illustrating. Again, we have fat and uh, nerve bundles coursing within the field. And we're going now towards the margin of the lip where it's going to transition now into a, uh, the uh, typical thin skin. We're now nearing the vermilion border, that border where the lip uh, uh, acquires a, a red hue when you're coming from the outside. Uh, it's still on the reddish portion of the lip. We can tell this by these long elongated uh, papillae with their contained capillaries within them. And then note that the epithelium all of uh, a sudden uh, there's a very, fairly sharp transition point even though this is cut at a little bit of an oblique angle where the epithelium has become a quite a bit thinner. Now we're going out now of the oral cavity 
and the epithelium is thinner. It's not associated with skin, and this is the region of the lip that's sort of on the exterior portion of the mouth as you're curving uh, out of the oral cavity. That has to be uh, sort of kept moist by licking uh, in this particular area. Now we're finally coursing outside and going down the outer margin, uh, exterior margin of the lip, and finally we can see uh, some flakes of keratin uh, uh, coming off. We can see we've lost the submucosa and or the um, glands within the submucosa. And finally, we should be getting into uh, thin skin as we're uh, showing a few sebaceous glands coming in. And then finally, uh, typical thin skin on the exterior surface. Uh, so this layering, typical thin skin, on the external surface, either the lip or the cheek area, a central core of obicularis oris muscle, so it's skeletal muscle in the center, um, buccinator muscle, of course, it was the cheek. Then you run into a typical mucous membrane, uh, a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that's very thick, an underlying lamina propria that supports it, and anchoring this mucous membrane to the interior surface of the uh, obicularis oris muscle or the buccinator muscle, whatever the case may be, is a very robust submucosa that will contain either labial glands or the uh, buccinator glands, these minor salivary glands of the cheek area. One can easily tell that you're dealing with a submucosal because of the mobility of the, uh, these two regions. Once again, if one places their teeth against the interior of the lip or the cheek, you can suck that mucous membrane between the teeth, showing you that great degree of mobility. Uh, and so you can uh, physically examine and determine where this submucosal layer uh, really is. <coughs> Simply another section of this same uh, vertical section of the lip which illustrates perhaps just a little bit better uh, uh, what one can see externally. The thin skin is empty, uh, ending approximately where the arrow now indicates. One can make out a little bit of keratin. It could have ended perhaps up a little bit farther if that was indeed stripped off. So we're on the external surface of the lip. This would be go going in the direction of typical thin skin. However, about the region of the arrow, or just a little bit uh, above that particular region, this is where the typical skin uh, thin will end, so the hairs and glands associated with thin skin will disappear. The epithelium and then becomes more translucent, so this is the region of the skin that is sort of slick, it's dry and hairless, that one uh, licks to keep moist, and as we go over uh, that border and course more towards uh, the oral cavity, one can see a rather a little bit better or more dramatic junction right about at this point. So this is where we're entering, actually entering the oral cavity, and the lip acquires that sort of smooth, uh, slippery appearance typical of a mucous membrane. And then of course as we uh, go on the inner side of the lip and into the oral cavity itself, uh, it becomes much, much uh, more dramatic. That is the depth of the epithelium. So these are perhaps a little bit better view of these transitioning points uh, as one courses uh, from the thin skin on the lower lip, courses uh, over the circumference of the uh, lip to enter the uh, oral cavity. A small region at increased magnification of one of the labial minor salivary glands, just confirming uh, some of the details for you, that is a compound tubular alveolar type of gland of the mixed variety. What is shown in the field is one of the larger interlobular uh, ducts, uh, mucous tubules, and some serous tubules and serous demolunes, as illustrated by the pointer. So this, these uh, minor salivary glands, as well as most of the glands in the cheek area, the bucin area, uh, area, are indeed mixed compound tubular uh, asner type glands. So all, both cell types are definitely present, and they have a, an elaborate 
inter and uh, intralobular duct system, though much shorter, of course, than one would encounter in the major salivary glands. This is a scanning view, once again, through the hard palate uh, within the oral cavity. It is lined, again, by a stratified squamous type of epithelium, but in this particular case, because of the trauma of uh, eating and the tongue rubbing, uh, rubbing upon it, uh, it should show some degree of cornification uh, along its uh, luminal surface. It has a rather dense lamina propria, as shown here, which will then attach the uh, mucous membrane directly to the uh, palatine bone, which is shown here. This is compact bone where the tip of the arrow now indicates to this particular area. One can even make out some of the herversion systems with this scanning objective. So in this particular case, the mucous membrane is anchored directly to overlying bone, forming a mucoperiosteum. Because it lacks, lacks this submucosal arrangement in most regions, particularly along the midline raffae and uh, near the gingival areas, this is why the hard palate, the epithelium thereof, or the mucous membrane thereof, is relatively immobile when you push on it with the dorsum of the tongue. Uh, so you have in this particular case, this region here, a mucoperiosteum. Now some regions which also that lie within this hard palate may show a little bit of a submucosa, but remains relatively immobile in uh, huge fold-like structures. One might even find some of the minor uh, salivary glands. So this is a view through the hard palate, the mucous membrane which is anchored in most regions quite firmly uh, to the bone. There are a few regions that do show an underlying submucosa, but they are not being shown here on this particular uh, preparation. A typical respiratory mucous membrane would lie on this particular surface of a section that had been taken uh, entirely through the hard palate, uh, but in this particular section it is missing. So this particular space as indicated by the arrow, would be going into the nasal cavity, and what could have been here was a lamina propria and a typical respiratory form of epithelium uh, giving you the lining of the nasal cavity. That is, that mucous membrane uh, lying on this particular surface of the hard palate. This is the lining epithelium of the hard palate as it faces the oral cavity, showing its cornified uh, nature. One can see that cells uh, make it all the way to the surface that retain their nuclei, <coughs> so I really wouldn't call this a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, but one that shows a more cornified uh, nature to it, and this is due to the mechanical trauma, of course, and the rubbing during uh, just the normal eating and digestive processes of things uh, rubbing upon and the abrasion, the trauma that this particular epithelium is subjected to. So this is typical of the epithelium lining the hard palate. This is the oral cavity surface of a portion of the soft palate. Note in this particular case a very thick stratified squamous epithelium of a non-keratinized variety, very similar in appearance to that lining the remainder of the oral cavity. Like the remainder of the oral cavity, it is going to be supported by a relatively firm but thin lamina propria. So in the soft palate region, this once again is the mucous membrane. Now also shown in this oral surface of the soft palate are very large mucus glands. These once again are minor salivary glands. In this particular case they're referred to as the palatine uh, glands. They are primarily a purely mucus type of minor salivary gland in this posterior aspect of the oral cavity. 
they lie within the submucosa of this particular region which once again can pr be confirmed by pressing the tongue on the uh, soft palate and noticing its pliability very pliable uh, area and then if one courses more towards the interior like we saw on the lip or in the cheek area there is a core of skeletal muscle in this particular case the palatine muscles here we see skeletal muscle cut lengthwise and in this particular area they're going in a variety of directions that is the muscle fibers and as finally as we go through the uh, soft palate one should encounter and indeed it is shown here a typical respiratory mucosa that is the epithelium is going to be a ciliated pseudostratified columnar type with goblet cells and it it too, its mucous membrane is going to be supported or made up of an underlying lamina propria as indicated by the arrow. In this particular case it is being infiltrated considerably by lymphocytes and uh, plasma cells, uh, obscuring it somewhat. So this is the soft palate, can be considered in a variety of layers. If we start on this surface the arrow indicates the position of the overlying nasal cavity. We then go through a typical respiratory uh, mucous membrane, a respiratory epithelium with its lamina propria. Then at the center of the core of this structure, we have the skeletal muscle of the palatine muscles. We then go to the region uh, facing the oral cavity, where we have a rather thick submucosa containing the minor salivary glands, the palatine glands that are purely mucous in nature, and then finally we get into a typical mucous membrane lining the oral cavity which consists of a very thick non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and of course the other portion of the mucosa it's supporting lamina propria as indicated by the arrow. Now as one courses posteriorly in the oral cavity as we move the slide we will then reflect around the posterior aspect of the soft palate as shown here and then enter the nasal cavity on this particular uh, surface and after a short region because the, uh, the surrounding curve let's say of the uh, posterior soft palate is usually if not always lined by a stratified squamous epithelium similar to the oral cavity eventually after a very short distance we should transition into a typical respiratory uh, mucous membrane which is showing, shown coming into the field of view at this particular location. Just a very quick clip on the uh, end of the nasal cavity uh, that portion uh, that's lying on the soft palate just to confirm the appearance of cilia on this surface, uh, there are a few goblet cells that aren't shown in this field of view, uh, some vessels within this uh, lamina propria. It's undergone a little bit of sort of uh, metaplastic uh, behavior, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, you can still see cilia quite well, uh, a few goblet cells uh, scattered around if you pulled out of the field every once in a while. Uh, And this is not uh, too uncommon in this area with uh, post-nasal drip and just the trauma of the soft palate opening and closing or sealing off the nasopharynx. So you get uh, this type of an appearance. It's not nearly as pretty as typical respiratory epithelium such as in the trachea nasal cavity or in the bronchial tree. But nonetheless, uh, in younger individuals, this would be uh, typical respiratory epithelium. Here it has changed slightly due to the uh, functional demands, I suppose, and age and uh, what have you. This particular section, as indicated by the arrow, shows a region of the under surface of the tongue. Uh, this is human tissue, and the core of the tongue, of course, is going to be made up of by made up of interlacing bundles of skeletal muscle. So this is the undersurface of the tongue. 
uh, showing its uh, mucous membrane, the epithelium of what is of which is a non-keratinized stratified squamous type of epithelium. As we're coursing now towards the tip of the tongue, the epithelium gets a little bit thicker. It starts being uh, becomes thrown into uh, projection type structures known as papillae, of which there are in humans three or four uh, varieties. But we can see the mucous membrane coursing now on the dorsal surface of the tongue. And note that in this particular area, as we saw with the hard palate, the mucosa, that is the epithelium in its underlying lamina propria, is anchored firmly to the muscle musculature of the tongue, uh, forming the core of this particular uh, organ. This is why you don't have any mobility or uh, movement of this mucous membrane, particularly on the dorsal surface of the tongue. So it's anchored very, very firmly to the underlying musculature. The epithelium becomes a little bit thicker, and these small projections that we see uh, coming into the field are the filiform type of papillae, these little hair-like projections that extend out into the oral cavity from the uh, lingual surface. So these are examples that are known as filiform type of papillae, little thread-like papillae that uh, give that furred texture to the uh, dorsal surface of the tongue. Here we see a different form of papillae, one that has a much larger connective tissue, a mound that comes out. And this is, in life, if one stuck their uh, tongue out and looked at it in a mirror, those little red dots that are observed are these types of papillae, which are referred to as fungiform papillae, which oftentimes give a sort of a mushroom uh, shape. The reason they appear more uh, reddish in uh, hue or color is because they have this large lamina propria core that extends into their interior near the surface, uh, bringing vasculature closer to the surface, and visually this is uh, perceived as a, a small red dot when you're looking at the surface. So those are the fungi form papillae. Here's an example of some of these other hair-like projections, some of which show some degree of cornification. These are the filiform uh, papillae as we course along this dorsal surface of the tongue. And finally, if we almost get to the edge of the field, uh, this particular section, another fungiform uh, papillae as indicated at the tip of the arrow. Now if we course back uh, towards the tip of the tongue once again, but not going all the way to the tip, uh, showing these this numerous or this abundant field of filiform type of papillae shown here, 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 and here. There are little uh, uh, projections coming from the surface. And then go down or course through the substance of the tongue, one can see the tremendous amount of muscle tissue. This is not surprising. This is a very muscular organ. Uh, surrounded by and tightly adherent to that surrounding and overlying uh, mucous membrane of the oral cavity. So this is all skeletal muscle uh, forming the core or the major component of the tongue forming its interior. All skeletal muscle of intrinsic and extrinsic musculature and here finally we get to the undersurface of the tongue uh, that mucous membrane at that location uh, once again. In this particular region, the very largest of the papillae can be found, that is the circumvallate papillae. They number anywhere from 8 to 12 in human beings. The section uh, in the set that is examined here is from a primate, that is some form of monkey, which characteristically may have just two or three at this particular location. So these large papillae as shown here and outlined by the arrow are the circumvallate papillae. So this is one circumvallate papillae. This is another circumvallate papillae. Now if we can move the slide laterally, one can visualize the uh, dorsal surface of the tongue as indicated here on this side. And if we course towards the other 
uh, margin of this particular section, one can see the other dorsal surface here. And what you're left with is an impression, which is true actually, that these papillae are countersunk down within the substance of the uh, tongue itself. So this would be the dorsal surface running here, so they're countersunk down within the actual tissue of the tongue and are surrounded three-dimensionally by a moat, which is shown here. And it would be in section, and another moat coming around that papillae and this other one here. So they're circumscribed by a space as they are countersunk within the tongue. Now interestingly, and it's shown here, these are minor salivary glands in this particular region. They are purely serous glands, they are compound tubular asner types of glands, as are all the minor salivary glands. But this tells you that this secretion, since there are no mucus cells present, it is a purely serous glands, it's a thin, watery, uh, proteinaceous type of secretion. Here one can see the duct emptying into the bottom of this moat. And what this fluid does is continually flush out and sort of sanitize this particular uh, region. Uh, so detritus and food particles and what have you don't get uh, clog up this particular area. So there's a constant flow uh, of washing this out. Now within this particular region is the highest concentration of taste buds. And they are usually found within the epithelial wall, the lateral wall of the covering the circumvallate papillae. So these light structures shown at the tip of the pointer are taste buds. They're very few in this particular section. If we go to this other circumvallate papillae, we can see four there and another one here of these taste buds. And then there's a half a dozen on the lateral wall of this particular our taste buds in the lateral wall of this particular circumvallate papillae. These are fairly heavily innervated as one expect, would expect, and if you look very carefully, the sort of gray type of material is nerve tissue coursing from the, underneath these taste buds and then into the substance of the tongue. So this is what you're seeing with the scanning uh, objective on the posterior aspect of this particular uh, tongue preparation. Now if one courses more into the interior of the tongue, one will be struck by the fact that it is indeed made up mainly of skeletal muscle, uh, as is true of the human and all species of course, but here it gives you a little bit better if one goes down and examines the uh, angle of the skeletal musculature, uh, skeletal fiber musculature making up the tongue, one will notice a very plaid type pattern. In other words, you'll have skeletal muscle fibers running in several directions, usually two or three, uh, one perpendicular to the other. Even at this magnification, we can see a lengthwise cut through skeletal muscle fibers at this angle, some going at right angles to it, and then we'll uh, see others that are coming out toward the viewer. So they're running at three different angles, each 90 degrees perpendicular to the other, giving this plaid appearance. As far as I am aware, this is one of the few places that this pattern of skeletal musculature, this interwoven plaid nature, occurs uh, in the human situation. All of these structures, these dark standing structures, are the units of von Ebner's gland, so they do extend considerably far down and into the musculature between the muscle fascicles uh, somewhat. Also shown just at the very edge of this particular section is probably one of the lingual, posterior lingual glands which are more mucous in character and is shown just on the very perimeter of this particular uh, section. So this is a section through the posterior region of the tongue and the region of the circumvallate uh, papillae um, that contains these circumvallate papillae, I should say, uh, at that junction between the anterior and posterior, uh, anterior two-thirds and the posterior one-third of the tongue. The minor salivary gland associated with the uh, circumvallate papillae 
Uh, it's purely serous. This is oftentimes referred to as von Ebner's uh, gland, it, one of which is shown coursing in the center of the field and covered by the arrow. Uh, one can also see one of the nerve bundles we saw in the scanning uh, view. And if one traces this uh, up towards the base of the circumvallate uh, papillae, or its moat, one can see this purely serous gland, its ductal system is one here, one coming from this direction will join, these compound tubular alveolar glands will join and actually empty into the moat uh, surrounding the uh, circumvallate papillae as shown uh, in this particular uh, view. So these are one of the few purely serous glands found within the oral cavity and they're usually associated with uh, the tongue and the circumvallate, persilla, circumvallate papillae specifically. This particular uh, field of view simply shows uh, four taste buds within the epithelial lining uh, uh, covering uh, one of the circumvallate papillae. So there are three taste buds uh, shown in this particular uh, field of view at intermediate power. They lie within the epithelium covering the lateral walls of the circumvallate papillae and they look very much their construction like a peeled orange uh, and one can see the segments that represent individual cells. A taste bud uh, seen at high magnification that was taken from or this particular preparation is from the uh, lateral surface of the epithelium covering my circumvallate papillae, but it does show as the little taste pore as located here. So you have thick microvilli sticking out that actually act as the sensory reception. This little pore, of course, is continuous with the lumen. Uh, and one of the functions of the von Ebner's gland is to keep this area flushed out and provide a new environment, a changing environment, so these cells, taste cells, can be stimulated. With this particular preparation, the actual taste cells in the relationship to nerve cells, as well as the supporting cells, cannot be differentiated one from the other. We can only say that this particular structure is a taste bud, this is the taste pore, and some robust microvilli can see, be seen, these little taste hairs can be seen extending from the lumen. So this is the typical appearance of taste buds. Individual cells can be made out, oftentimes having the character of a peeled orange or a stave-like appearance. And they're always within, within the epithelium of the tongue or the soft palate or wherever they are encountered. They'll look very much uh, like this particular structure, this taste bud, as indicated by the pointer. A small region of the interior of the tongue uh, showing uh, structures. This particular structure here is a one of the minor salivary glands, one of the posterior lingual glands, which are primarily uh, mucous in nature. Like all salivary glands are compound tubular acinar type of glands, but in this particular case it's primarily, that is the posterior lingual gland, it's primarily a mucus uh, secreting gland and the mucus tubules can be seen in this particular field. But what perhaps is much of more importance is if one looks at the musculature, the skeletal musculature of the tongue, Note the nature of the interwoven pattern as seen at increased magnification as one uh, course is through. The different fibers running at uh, 90 degree angles one to the other and usually one can visualize uh, three different directions giving this plaid appearance to the skeletal musculature. This seems to be or uh, I believe it to be a relatively unique feature of the tongue musculature. So this is simply a view looking at the direction of the muscle fibers of skeletal muscle uh, within the tongue uh, musculature itself. Uh, just illustrating perhaps a little bit more clearly that, was distinct, that distinctive interwoven pattern.
The image shown in the center of the field of view, and as indicated by the pointer, is a developing tooth located within the jaw of a fetus. The oral cavity is this space shown at the tip of the pointer, so this surface is the gingival surface, that is the gum region, which of course is going to be lined by a thick uh, stratified squamous type of epithelium as is the remainder of the oral cavity and a very prominent uh, lamina propria at this particular point. Immediately beneath and is going to develop around the tomb, a tooth is alveolar bone, which is shown uh, forming here a kind of a spongy type bone, and this will eventually form around the base of the tooth or the root of the tooth and provide the alveolar socket which the tooth will reside within. Even at this relative this scanning uh, image, some of the cell types associated with the developing uh, tooth can be visualized. The, the t tip of the arrow illustrates a single cell layer of very tall cells. These are referred to as ameloblasts, and they lay down the enamel of the tooth. A second type uh, cell type that is shown are the odontoblasts, as indicated by the tip of the pointer. Actually, they re their cell bodies are within this pulp cavity, and they produce and lay down the dentin, the second hard component of the uh, tooth crown and, and, and root, and as indicated by the pointer. Uh, so those structures and those cell types are fairly evident on this particular uh, portion of the developing uh, tooth. Increased magnification of the previous developing tooth simply to illustrate the ameloblast, that is that cell type that lays down the enamel. The nuclear profiles are, of this particular cell type are shown at the tip of the arrow, all lined up in a perfect row, almost appears like a simple columnar epithelium, and the apices of the ameloblasts are shown now at the tip of the pointer. So this cell extends from where the tip of the pointer now indicates to this region. Close observation of this very dense red layer here, which is the enamel, will show little projection sticking out, and this gives you the idea that the enamel is actually laid down in a series of prisms that follow a spiral course, and one, each ameloblast uh, is responsible for the production of each of these enamel prisms that are tightly submitted together. This enamel is the hardest substance of the body, about 99% uh, an organic type of material, and once the tooth erupts and passes through the gingiva, the ameloblasts are lost, and as a consequence, uh, once the tooth is ruptured and extends out into the oral cavity, uh, that is the full complement of enamel to a given tooth and a given individual, uh, and uh, no more enamel can be produced. At, this is a region of that developing tooth. Once again, the arrow illustrates the ameloblast, and this red material underneath the ameloblast uh, is indicative of the enamel that's being laid down. I went to a different area to show the dentin in this very hard tissue, which is being laid down by the odontoblast and we're having some oblique sections through them in this particular area. The, the cell bodies will be found as these odontoblasts. But this particular area shows quite well a fine striped appearance to the dentin, this very hard bone-like structure. You can see lengthwise stripes going through it. These are not artifacts. These are dentinal tubules that will actually contain the processes, the cytoplasmic processes of the odontoblast. Those processes run in these minute tubes all the way to the enamel dentinal junction, 
And so one can actually understand that if there's a surface defect in the enamel, these sensory type cells can perceive that sensation and transmit it in, uh, on to uh, nerves within the pulp cavity. And this is why either with the defective enamel or very thin enamel as some people call it, uh, natural occurring defects, some individuals have much greater sensitivity to their teeth than do others. So these are the so-called tomes processes or dentinal tubules and the contained processes, uh, the dentinal processes from the underlying uh, odontoblasts. So this is fairly well mineralized in this particular section. This material is mainly organic matrix being laid down and so this is what some people refer to as pre-dentin. And if we move closer now into the pulp cavity uh, and just focus up and down this very hard tissue, these are the cell bodies and this oblique section of the odontoblast. And remember, it was their processes that went up into these uh, stripes, these uh, dentinal tubules. We just didn't have a very good uh, view of the cell type, the odontoblast. In a true uh, vertical cut, they also will form a simple uh, columnar type of lining. So on this side of the developing tooth, we have the ameloblast laying down enamel. On this side, we have the odontoblast laying down dentin up to this point, and right about where the tip of the arrow now indicates is the dentinal enamel junction. A small region of uh, the pulp forming pulp cavity is shown here just to show a primitive vascularized innervated uh, type of connective tissue. I should also add the adonoblasts are shown here at the extreme lower left as well as the dentin. The adonoblasts remain uh, within the tooth throughout the lifespan of the tooth or the individual and will slowly continue to maintain and lay down dentin. Whereas formerly the ameloblast, as was stated uh, a little bit earlier, are lost at tooth eruption. An additional section through a younger developing tooth that shows a little bit clearer because, this, because it's younger, the section is a, uh, considerably thinner, showing the features that were examined uh, previously. The enamel is shown to about this point. So this is forming enamel, as indicated by the arrow. The bright orange color is dentin, being laid down by this tall cell on the circumference of the uh, pulp cavity, which is showing here, the developing pulp cavity. So these are the odontoblasts. Uh, and perhaps that shows it a little bit, their tall uh, columnar nature laying down the dentin. Now, if one traces around the circumference of this younger developing tooth, the same features will be made out as we described uh, or was described earlier. And because of the oblique angle up on the uh, area uh, forming the sort of the crown of the tooth, as one traces the ameloblasts around and then looks carefully at the enamel that is being laid down by the ameloblast, one can see these little mounds or little bulges. Yeah, these are little oblique cuts through the individual enamel prisms that are being laid down by the surrounding ameloblast. Likewise, the dentin, which is shown uh, and indicated by the and crossed by the pointer here, one can, can once again make out those faint stripes coursing across it. In, in sort of a vertical direction. Those are the uh, dentinal tubules, which will have odontoblast processes within them. The odontoblasts are located here. And in, the, in addition, this section shows uh, mineralizing dentin, as well as a real good illustration of pre-dentin, the unmineralized uh, form, which is shown here by the arrow, that's pre-dentin. So if we trace now around the remainder of the circumference of this earlier developing tooth, one can see uh, these structures repeat once and once are uh, over and over again.
and then this is a, a, a fairly decent illustration of a very early forming uh, pulp uh, cavity. So this is the developing tooth showing the immunoblast, its secretory product, the enamel of a tooth which is lost at, uh, as these teeth rupture, and then the dentin, the product of the odontoblast that remain throughout life. This particular field illustrates a scanning picture of the parotid uh, gland, the largest of the major salivary glands. In the human, it is a purely serous compound tubular acinar form of gland, as are all the salivary glands. In this particular case, elements of the ductal system at this low magnification can be seen uh, coursing across the field of view. In this particular lobule, the seam of the lobule is shown at the tip of the pointer. And these dark staining cells are the serous elements, the serous cells making up the secretory units, the tubules and asini of this particular gland. Now, as is typical of human, numerous adipocytes or white fat cells can be seen scattered throughout uh, the parenchyma. And these cells uh, accumulate with age and become more numerous in this gland as the aging process continues. So this is just a scanning view showing the human uh, parotid gland. This duct here, large even at, uh, at this particular magnification, is one of the interlobular ducts, probably receiving a tributary uh, from this one, uh, even though it appears within a, a, a lobule itself, you can tell by its size and the surrounding connective tissue. These would be more akin to the interlobular uh, duct system as indicated by the pointer, those particular ducts. So let's just course uh, throughout its extent. Here we can see some more interlobular ducts and are probably coursing in the direction to unite with this, uh, which will become an interlobular ducts at, at this particular uh, point. Coursing, so this is the surrounding capsule, I believe, of the, wasn't the septic, uh, surrounding capsule of the parotid gland. So we're, and this dark surrounding structure, we just happen to be getting a section through it, is that of an adjacent lymph node. So this is actually the capsule out here, rather than a major septa, as I originally had proposed. And here we can see septa going up this way. So this region here is a lobule of this uh, parotid gland, shown uh, here. These units repeat themselves over and over again. So this is a low-powered scanning view of the human parotid gland, a compound tubular acinar gland of a purely serous type, which is characterized in the adult by an abundance of adipose tissue. This field is indicative of the parotid gland, human parotid gland, seen at high magnification. What this segment illustrates are the abundance of adipocytes or fat cells. It always also shows the serous secretory uh, cells making up the tubules and asner units of this particular gland. Remember, this is a purely serous type of salivary gland. So these are the secretory units as indicated by the pointer. Now extending, the initial duct system extending from the secretory units is a very small duct 
called an intercalated duct. There just happens to be a grazing section through the lengthwise uh, course of this particular duct. It's these cells here, these elongated ones, it will have a very narrow lumen and then it comes up and dives either down or up and this little duct here that has a hue or a color to surrounding secretory elements is an intercalated duct. The lumen is shown at the tip of the pointer. The nuclei of cells comprising the duct wall are now being indicated by the pointer. And so this small tiny duct is the initial portion of the intralobular duct system and is referred to as an intercalated duct. It then courses up and will join these much lighter ducts which are sort of oblique and uh, all various angles cut through them which will range from uh, simple columnar to simple cuboidal. They will stand out because of the very light staining cytoplasm uh, and are oftentimes referred to as the striative ducts of these major salivary glands. So within lobules two ductal forms will be found to intralobular forms. Initially it is the intercalated duct which will then drain into the much larger and more easily visualized striated ducts. Both of these lie within lobules of the salivary glands and constitute the intralobular duct system of salivary glands. An additional region at the, of the parotid gland as seen at higher magnification to illustrate a typical appearing striated duct, that second part of the interlobular duct system of the parotid with its typical lying, uh, lining epithelium or a simple cuboidal to a simple columnar. Very close observation even with the routine stain one will see the so-called basal striations of this particular duct, very, very faint. If this were stained with iron and hematoxylin, they would stand out rather markedly, uh, and hence this is why they were named striated ducts. These are striations are simply basal lateral foldings of the plasma lemma or the cell membrane and parallel aligned mitochondria. So this type of a tubule, this portion of the ductal system is involved uh, in a considerable amount of fluid ion transport. Another feature that is visualized on this particular ductal system are these dense nuclei. And what they're showing is a capillary network that completely envelops this ductal system. Obviously if this epithelium is involved in fluid and ion transport, it has to have somewhere to go and that place where it is going is into the surrounding and investing capillary uh, network. Now also shown, though it's a, a relatively poor example, is this small nondescript duct at the tip of the point or made up of four epithelial cells that stain very similarly to the secretory units. This again is another section through the intercalated duct, the beginning ductal system, and the other portion of the intralobular duct system. Again, the parotid gland seen at high magnification indicating another intercalated duct as shown at the uh, tip of the pointer the lumen of the little duct is right where the tip of the pointer now is indicating. So this group of five nucleated cells of sort of low cuboidal is uh, the intercalated duct. It then seems to meander obliquely off this way and perhaps will loop up. We can see another little profile though it's slightly out of focus up in this particular region. And then finally it would perhaps join up with this duct the second part of the interlobular duct system, uh, a smaller variety or a smaller caliber uh, duct, but this is definitely a striated duct 
uh, just s smaller than the previous example that was illustrated. Another example of the ductal system that characterizes the human parotid gland, perhaps a little bit better illustrating more crisply uh, the dimensions and the size of an intercalated duct as indicated and surrounded by the pointer, hidden within the secretory parenchyma of this particular gland. So a section through a cross-sectional profile is illustrated here. It then comes obliquely, and another little cross-sectional profile of this intercalated duct is shown here. The lumen is located as this minute space in the center. The lumen of this particular uh, section through it is located as indicated by the arrow. These two ductal profiles with the lighter staining, taller type of epithelium are typical striated ducts. This one indicated by the pointer as simply being a larger caliber than the one lying adjacent to it. Another intercalated duct is shown at the tip of the pointer. Note once again with regard to the striated ducts, its association with endothelial cells, and in this particular section the red hue of contained erythrocytes is also shown. Uh, so this is the interlobular duct system of the parotid gland seeing that increased magnification. This particular field is representative of the second of the major salivary glands to be considered, that is the submandibular gland. The submandibular gland like the parotid, is a compound tubular acinar form of gland. Unlike the parotid, it is a mixed gland, as can be seen by viewing this particular section at low magnification. With regard to the secretory cell types present, that is the mucus and serous cells, the serous cells in human tissue are by far the most prominent. This low power scanning view of the submandibular gland. Now what can be seen perhaps a little bit more crisply on this plastic embedded material that was not as easy to demonstrate on the previous section of the prodded are the lobules. Each of these major, uh, or these major salivary glands, as well as the minor salivary glands to some extent, are subdivided into lobes and lobules. If one looks at the tip of the arrow, a small thin connective tissue seam can be seen and, and as indicated by the arrow. So this unit now being crossed by the arrow back and forth is a lobule within the submandibular gland. And now perhaps the naming of this ductal system becomes more apparent because the ducts as indicated by the tip of the pointer coursing throughout the field, another group is coming in this direction, because they lie within the lobule are simply referred to as intralobular ducts. And in the parotid, and as true here, it will have two subcomponents to it, that is the intralobular duct system, an intercalated duct, and the striated duct, which is visible quite readily here. Those two subcomponents make up the intralobular duct system. Now this particular region also shows a much larger duct lying in the interlobular connective tissue, therefore it is referred to as an interlobular duct, or one lying between the lobules. These will eventually blend in like roots on a tree into a larger major duct that will drain the entire gland. Now, in addition to being a compound tubular acinar 
mixed gland with the greatest ratio being serous in nature, another feature can be shown at the scanning with the scanning objective that makes this gland uh, easily distinguishable one from the other. Notice the numerous profiles through the striated duct. That portion of the interlobular duct is indicated by the pointer. Numerous profiles can be observed as one peruses and courses around uh, this particular uh, gland. Numerous profiles are visible. This is because the submandibular gland, that striated duct reaches a very long length and this, that is characteristic of this particular gland and therefore because of its long length as compared to the other salivary glands it shows several uh, more cross-sectional profiles or longitudinal profiles when looked at or viewed in section because of this uh, exaggerated development of the striated duct. So therefore that is another criteria that can be used if needed uh, in differentiating uh, uh, salivary glands. Not only is a mixed gland with the predominant secretory cell type being serous, it has this very elaborately and well-developed striatal ductal component of the interlobular uh, duct system. So several cross-sectional profiles should be uh, visible and that immediately catches one's eye. The submandibular gland as seen with an intermediate powered objective immediately demonstrates that this is a mixed gland, it is a compound tubular alveolar gland, and when looking at the center of the field one can see the serous tubules cut in section as well as mucus cells. So these are not fat cells, these are mucin containing secretory cells. And then the extraordinary number of profiles cut through this a very elaborate striated ductal uh, system. And once again, as was true of the parotid, note the association of the striated ducts in particular with their relationship to the blood vasculature as these, as in the, these particular ducts, as is true of the parotid, are involved in uh, fluid ion transport. So this relationship uh, with the blood vasculature is not surprising. A portion of the submandibular gland as seen at increased magnification showing several cross-sectional profiles of secretory tubules and asini which are made up of the serous type of cell which will indeed in humans form the majority. The lumen of this particular tubule is shown here. The serous cell is characterized by a very granular uh, dark staining appearance with roundish type basally positioned nuclei. Also shown in the field is a section through a mucus tubule. Remember, even though on initial scanning uh, views this may have uh, presented itself as being fat cells, but close observation will show that these are indeed mucus cells. The lumen of this mucus tubule is shown here, and the cell is being outlined here. Typically mucus in appearance, very light, transparent granules, though the outer circumference of individual granules can be perceived on this particular cell. So this is not a clear empty cell, but the mucin granules are transparent, not picking up a stain, so light transmits immediately through them. Also the nuclei will appear compressed uh, near the base and have a more flattened appearance in comparison to the serous cells which show a more rounded uh, profile. Now almost all of the mucus tubules end in little caps of cells 
called cirrus damaloons. A part of one is shown here. So cirrus cells form a little cap on the ends of these mucous tubules and through intercellular secretory capillaries or canaliculi they're called uh, will gain access to the lumen of that uh, mucous tubule. Now also shown here is a fairly decent example of the intercalated duct of the submandibular gland. The lumen is shown at the tip of the pointer and the circumference of the duct is being traced by the tip of the pointer. And this particular intercalated duct consists of five epithelial cells in this particular cross-sectional profile. An additional intercalated duct is shown at the arrow of this submandibular gland and it gives a comparison in size to two smallish sections through the striated portion of the interlobular duct system of the submandibular. So this particular ductal system is a small striated duct as is this particular profile located here. Two additional striated ducts showing an extreme <coughs> magnification, indeed showing tight junctions binding cell apices together. Others are shown in this profile, as well as the close relationship to the vasculature and a hint of the basolateral infolding is shown here and over on this particular side. Also shown in the field are the, some of the details uh, uh, showing that granules do indeed reside within the uh, mucous tubule and then the character of the surrounding uh, serous elements as well. A portion of a mucous tubule coursing in this direction and splitting somewhat but ending with the serous demaloon caps uh, perhaps a little bit better illustrated in this particular region showing the just the beginnings of these intercellular canaliculi or capillaries allowing the secretion from the serous cells to gain access to the lumen uh, of the mucous tubule. So these are examples of serous demaloons and one gets just a hint of these intercellular secretory uh, capillaries or canaliculi. So each of the mucous tubules is going to be ca capped by these uh, demaloon uh, type cells. This tubule, mucous tubule here has this cap like arrangement of several serous cells uh, that are going to be part of this particular secretory unit. And again, striated ducts and intercalated ducts, a mixed gland with the serous cells being the most prominent, and mucous tubules that are ending in little caps or serous demaloons are all characteristics plus the extraordinary length of the striated duct of the submandibular gland. The sublingual gland, as seen with the scanning objective, like the other salivary glands, it is a compound tubular acinar gland, and like the submandibular gland, it is a mixed gland consisting of both serous and mucous elements. However, this composite gland, the sublingual gland, its major secretory component is the mucous cell in relationship to the serous cell. So in this particular case, the mucous cell is the predominant uh, cell type, as can be seen by scanning this particular uh, gland. The other striking feature, if one looks carefully and remembers uh, the architecture of the submandibular gland, note the relatively few profiles one sees 
of the striated ducts. Though they are present, the number of cross-sectional profiles seen are not nearly as prevalent as in the submandibular gland. Also shown as a major portion through uh, one of the major excretory ducts, as well as an interlobular duct coursing in the connective tissue between lobules in that direction. So if one takes into consideration this lobule as outlined by the pointer, only a few scattered profiles of the interlobular duct system are present. This is because the mucus or the secretion is of a much more viscous nature and the length of this duct would be counterproductive for this very thick, more viscous type of uh, secretion. So it should be uh, somewhat uh, shorter and smaller, one would uh, think, uh, uh, because of the physical demands on the, of, of the particular secretion uh, produced. So this is a region through the sublingual gland seen at increased magnification showing the predominance of the mucus cell forming mucus tubules in this particular gland. Most of the serous elements present, most, but not all, are in the form of serous dentaloons as illustrated by the pointer. Those groups of serous cells that form caps at the ends of the mucus tubules. On occasion, a few scattered serous tubules can be observed, as shown here and, and at this particular region. However, the vast majority of the tubules are mucus in nature and are capped by the serous demolune. Likewise, the striated duct or the entire interlobular ductal system is much, much shorter Therefore, fewer cross-sectional profiles are observed. For this particular gland, there's a confluence of striated ducts in this direction. One can see it meandering, and then we'll go into this large area of connective tissue, which is an example of an interlobular duct uh, within that surrounding connective tissue. And this is a tall columnar epithelium in this particular case, and it looks like it will shortly become stratified. So this is the sublingual gland uh, characterized by the very short ductal system and the predominance of the mucus uh, cell type uh, in comparison to the submandibular and the parotid gland, which of course is a purely serous gland. A region of the sublingual gland showing the large mucus tubules at increased magnification, one here, and how they end in the little serous demaloon uh, caps. This particular tubule was splitting, one going in this direction, I believe, one going in this way. But here are the serous demaloons, these little cap-like cells. Some more show in here, some more show in here, and another group uh, show in here as well. So this is typical of submandibular gland. The majority of cells being of the mucus character with a few caps illustrating the uh, serous demaloon uh, type. The beginning of the ductal uh, system is shown here, or it's not the exact beginning, but this is sort of a transition going between the typical striated duct and the uh, intercalated duct, which are going to be a little bit fatter and uh, stockier in this, and shorter in this particular gland. Two adjacent profiles of an intercalated duct uh, from the sublingual gland. The lumen is shown here. The pointer outlines the circumference of this intercalated duct. Uh, a small intercalated duct is shown here with a tiny lumen located at this particular uh, location. A small region of that major interlobular duct that's rapidly becoming a 
joining to form the major excretory duct of the sim sublingual gland, showing its stratified columnar nature. Uh, the top, top layer of cells, of course, are columnar in character, and a bottom layer of cells is coming into the view. Uh, so this is where one can find typical stratified columnar epithelium. In the major ducts, interlobular ducts, or the forming excretory ducts of the salivary glands. In this case, it is the sublingual.